All right. So, hi, I'm Sarah. Hi, I'm Clara Callahan, and welcome to this little recording of uh, A Day in the Life of the Parsonage, which is um, part of Bronte 2020, which is happening on Friday the 4th of September via Zoom in order to raise money for the Parsonage, which we uh, all know has been struggling like so many other museums at this time. And we are really grateful to everyone who's, uh, you know, attended and watching this today for participating. Um, we have with us, we have with us today uh, Rebecca York, Head of Communications and Marketing at the Parsonage, and Anne Dinsdale, Principal Curator at the Parsonage. And they're joining us live from the Parsonage today. And we'll invite them to say a few words to you. Um, hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, you might know me um, if you're involved in the Parsonage at all, because sometimes my name comes in your newsletters and in the Gazette. Um, it's, it's really great to be able to talk to you this morning from the Parsonage. We've just opened to members for the first time after being closed for COVID. Really, really significant milestone today. And I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to all of you who are watching, who have supported us the last few months by donations, by joining up to this event, by tweeting, donating, coming to Bronte lounges. It's just brilliant. We feel we've got a really strong community and, you know, Claire and Sarah, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Not going to get emotional, but it, you know, it, means, a, it, it means a great deal that you, you've done this. And, you know, so far, the numbers you've raised is, 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 is great. I'm going to let you keep that secret for now, but it's, it's, it's great. Thank you so much. Well, it's a cause that's very near and dear to our hearts as well. So it's a pleasure. And I'd just like to add my thanks to Rebecca's. Um, we're really sorry we can't be um, there on the 4th, um, but we've just reopened. We've got um, members arriving in the wet, and it's a really wet day in Haworth today. <laughs> um, and we'd like to thank everybody for their support through this very difficult time. Thank you both. And we're just delighted to see it reopen and, and fingers crossed it continues not just to rain in Howarth because it seems very suitable <laughs> but that it all goes really smoothly. Um, so we wanted to maybe start by taking you, I imagine at the moment there's not a typical day in the past of mm. right now but if we can go back to pre-COVID um, in your jobs both of you doing um, you know, different roles what did a typical day in the parsonage look like for both of you? Uh, there was never a typical day um, pre-COVID um, in the land of the, before. Uh, you know, a comms and marketing day also includes you know, looking at the events programme, talking with the team about the, you know, future programmes, working with Anne about setting up um, private tours and visits. And visits. Uh, we'll be talking about you know, fundraising long term. There's all the um, work that goes into the being um, an Arts Council MPO, you know, reporting and planning, um, strategic thinking, and then also things like, oh, I've better open Twitter and see what's out there today. <laughs> and, you know, in the ideal world, we've got plenty of time to plan our social media strategy and have to be are just reactive because we're so busy here. So it's just a real, um, what I love about it is that it is varied. To, yeah, so I don't want to leave anybody out, you know, but I know that lots of you, you know, through your connections with the society and the work that we do, will know Diane and Lauren and Sue and Harry. And so you know, I work with a really great team um, and it's just busy and varied um, and it's only going to be more of the same going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to let Anne speak now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's always a lot of work to do at the Parsonage in the morning um, in preparation for the visitors arriving. So there's a, a whole lot of cleaning and yeah. housekeeping, which goes on um, recording weather conditions and temperatures. Um, and we've got a really dedicated team of um, museum assistants uh, who are very vigilant and as they're going about their daily work cleaning the collection yeah. um, they're also noting any signs of damage or deterioration so there's a lot of um, sort of housekeeping um, and cleaning collection items um, in the morning um, you never know what the post um, is going to bring. Um, you might end up getting an email which changes the whole course of your week even. Um, 
in the post COVID world, um, no idea what, what's going to happen, but, um, you might get an email in the morning telling you about an important brunt or letter, which is being auctioned, um, in a week's time. Um, and then it, you know, we've, you've got to, um, look at, um, researching provenance and authenticity. Um, and trying to look at where you might get funding. Um, so a, um, a big part of my role in the past has been um, acquisitions um, for to different grants. Um, also, we, we get um, instances where people get in touch um, to tell us about some item that they've got sitting around at home um and so like i say you never know what the post is going to bring um we've had some quite exciting discoveries uh, that have come to us through the post um we get a lot of researchers as well coming into the parsonage library um people working on all different kinds of projects and all different levels and we've got to guide them with their research, suggest material um, that they might find useful. Um, and then we get a lot of research um, inquiries by email and phone and letter, and they've all got to be dealt with on top of our role of caring for mm -hmm. the collection. Mm -hmm. So you guys are busy. <laughs> Yeah, all the time. And what Anne said about, you know, it takes one email or phone call. I mean, that's the same in comms. So it is really varied and, um, and, and, that, and that is what keeps it special, as well as the amazing building, you know. The days when you're at pounding the laptop and writing to-do lists are the days I try and find five minutes to walk through the parsonage mm. and remind myself why I'm here and why we do it and why it's important and just put ourselves back in the shoes of visitors. Um, that's really special. And also I really like eavesdropping on visitors. <laughs> talking, <laughs> like talking about what they can see and how it makes them feel. You know, that's really important. Mm. It mustn't be easy to be, you know, busy, busy, busy at the computer and forget about what it's for. So that's really important. So there are so many fascinating things on display in the museum. And I just was wondering, how do you decide what to put on display? And <laughs> maybe if you could talk about some of the strangest or quirkiest things that you've ever had to put on display. And, and you'd mentioned that um, you get some really exciting things in the post from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of those interesting items. Yeah. That you've used. Yeah. Um, well, it depends regarding the displays. Um, sometimes it actually just comes down to the things that I like. <laughs> um, mm. We do change the displays um, on a regular basis because fortunately we've got um, in storage and it's good practice to rotate um, items so they're not subjected to too much light or damage. Um, and also we get a lot of repeat visits. So it's good for people to have the opportunity to see different items when they come. Um, sometimes we're kind of, um, it's dictated really um, what we display. Um, for example, this year we've been celebrating the bicentenary of Anne Bronte and we don't have a huge collection of Anne Bronte items. So we've pretty much put out the entire collection. Mm. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's the first time that this has ever been done. So all our Anne um, items are out Will be um, you will be using the same um, exhibition next year. We'll be staying with that because I think there was so much disappointment from people who haven't had the chance to uh, actually visit and see that for themselves. Um, so sometimes it's what's actually happening, you know, what we're celebrating, which dictates the items um, that we put on display. Um, sometimes they're new 
um, acquisitions to the collection, like the wonderful um, little book by Charlotte Bronte, um, which we acquired so memorably last year, um, and which went on display um, in February this year. For companions. Um, so again, that little book will remain out um, so that people who haven't had the chance to to enjoy it will will be able to do that. Um, and about exciting things coming in the post. Um, I think probably the most memorable item arrived probably 20 years ago. We had a letter from a lady, a very elderly lady in the south of England, who sent us a photocopy of a um, tiny, tiny um, watercolour sketches that were in her possess possession, which she believed were the work of Charlotte Bronte. Oh, wow. We were excited when we saw them because they were clearly um, by Charlotte. Mm. And in um, correspondence with this lady, it soon a uh, whole collection of items sitting at home, um, which she'd acquired through her grandmother had worked for um, to her over the years. And um, it actually resulted in her nephew bringing us this amazing collection of material to look through, including a, a pistol, which um, was believed to have been owned by um, Branwell. Wow. And um, that, so that was very exciting. And then um, a few days later, the nephew phoned us again and said, has the post arrived at the parsonage yet? And um, he said, because I think my aunt sent you um, something that she thought you might be interested in. And it turned out she'd sent us um, a pistol in a jiffy bag through the post. <laughs> and this, it was an incredible antique firearm with a, a lethal bayonet attachment. <laughs> And um, we believe it's the one that Emily actually described yeah. in Wuthering Heights, which was clearly in the parsonage. Um, I don't even know if it's legal to send it like. Probably not. Post. Probably not. They'd ask you at the post office <laughs> now, wouldn't they? <laughs> oh, that's an amazing story. That is an great. amazing story. Uh, thank you. Um, so every year you close in January and you have, you alluded to the cleaning that you do constantly throughout the day already, but January is yeah. the time when you close and you've obviously take stock and do a huge amount of um, like restoration and, and kind of heritage preservation work. Can you kind of tell us the kind of things that you do during, or typically during a day? Yeah, um, we always have a lot of work to do in January and because it's normal time we're closed, um, we we take the opportunity to get all that work done so you can imagine if you've got 70 80 going through the parsonage um it starts to get a bit battle scarred by the end of the year so in january we have teams of decorators coming in um all the wiring the plumbing is checked um the alarm systems um and we house mm -hmm. so every book um, is cleaned the strong room where we where we hold all the um, the really valuable items um, is thoroughly cleaned everything's checked and inspected mm -hmm. all the furniture um, is thoroughly checked um, and given a wax polish so there's a huge amount of work to get through mm. yeah. wow. Yeah, and uh, we fairly recently we introduced um, a new um, event in the close period because we realised that a lot of people are actually very interested in knowing more about how we care, yeah, um, and how we look at how we look after it, and so we actually um, do an event usually in where people have the opportunity to come in. Um, and see for themselves the work that's that's taking place. How interesting. Yeah, there's another book idea for you, Anne. <laughs> 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 um, 
Um, okay, thank you. Um, so, Anne, as we know from your very fabulous At Home with the Brontes book, which I have my uh, signed copy, proudly just to see it <laughs> like the case, um, the parsonage has got, undergone many changes since the mm-hmm. time of the Brontes. Can you tell us about how it looked when they were living there? Because many of our audience today will have seen Sally Wainwright's uh, biopic mm. To Walk Invisible and will know if they visited the parsonage, how very different it looked in the film compared to how it looks as a visitor in the 21st century. Yeah. Um, well, we worked with the production team from To Walk Invisible. Um, they used... Uh, Grant Montgomery um, to design um, the incredible sets and they they were lucky, they had an advantage in that we're kind of limited to um, the material that we've actually got in the collection um, throughout we try to um, not use reproduction items uh, we try to use items that were owned by the Brontes um, so it kind of limits how much um, material we can put into the rooms um, and it has an impact on how lived in um, the house feels whereas they they could just you know go out and buy whatever they needed to recreate it um, they did actually recreate a lot of the genuine um, furniture and material that we've got in the collection. Um, And I think in terms of the actual decor, um, they they kind of went with the analysis that we'd had carried out um, back in 2011. Um, We did a lot of scientific um, analysis um, where samples were taken from around the parsonage, from the woodwork and the walls and the ceilings. Um, and we were able to um, kind of establish a sort of decorative hierarchy of um, finishes um, that had been used in the past. And it amazing um, story and called Alison McDermott. And she was able to establish what colour schemes are likely to have um, been used in the Bronte period. So then we embarked on a period of having specially produced paint colours to replicate the ones that had been found. Um, We could tell, for example, which walls had been papered, establish exactly what wallpaper had been used in most cases. We were able to um, order ones that had been dated from that period so I think when you go around the parsonage today, it looks closer than it's ever done um, before to how it would have been when the Brontes lived. So, um, so I think that's the main difference between um, the, the real parsonage and the, the to walk invisible parsonage. <laughs> Uh, an uncanny experience wandering onto their sets for the mm. drama. Mm. Um, it made my hair stand on end. It was it was quite experience. I bet. And actually, that kind of leads into to something I wanted to ask you, and it picks up on something you said earlier, Rebecca, about um, emotional experiences in the parsonage. Um, as part of the uh, uh, trying to, I guess. Uh, Show some love for the parsonage. We started a little hashtag, the parsonage and me, on Twitter to try and get people to share their memories uh-huh. and their experiences. Because I think anyone that has been a visitor has had a powerful moment, uh, whether that's kind of with a particular object, with a particular room. Um, and you guys obviously must, as I think you said earlier, you eavesdrop on people and you must see and, and uh, be exposed to those very powerful experiences. So what is that like and how do you deal with that? I think for some people, that moment, that powerful moment you talk about is very private and uh, they might share it with us later, you know, via social media or via handwritten cards. You know, we are a literary society, a literary museum. People write to us, you know, which is really lovely. Um, sometimes people can't wait to share with you 
mm. it, what it what it means to them you know especially if they are revisiting after having come a long time ago with mm. a member of family that is no longer with them or a school trip it is that sort of um nostalgia and and the past the past images are really for me I first came on a school trip in the late 1960s <laughs> and um, I think it was the story, you know, the idea of the three sisters, because I'm one of three sisters as well, um, you know, kind of struggling against the odds and producing those amazing books. And I've, I, I'm in a very unusual position in that I've actually spent more than half my life working here. Um, I think during the lockdown with the house has changed, I've had to do a lot of work that perhaps I wouldn't normally have done. You know, I've been down scrubbing, skirting boards and vacuuming and um, because the parsonage domestic house has got a kind of monumental reputation. It is an internationally museum. Um, with people from all over the world, you know, beat. Um, but suddenly it felt like it had become a, a quite a vulnerable mm -hmm. little building. Um, it's been a really, really anxious time for all of us. Uh, and it means a huge amount to actually see visitors coming through the door again today and engaging with the collection, because that's what we're all about here. So you've now reopened after yeah. five months of having your doors closed. So what can we expect um, the Parsonage to be doing over the next year? People coming to the Parsonage in the next few months will have um, the same welcoming experience that they've always had. It'll feel quite special, I think, because of social distancing. Yeah. We have introduced timed ticketing and allowing six people every 15 minutes, which actually results in with six people at any one part of the historic building at any time. So actually, if that's you and your family, you have that downstairs to yourself. Then you have the upstairs to yourself. And then you have the exhibition room to yourself. It's a really special experience. We have put lots of work into thinking about the one-way system. There's hand sanitizers. Our staff are wearing visors and, uh, you know, nice um, uh, banded <laughs> masks. <Hey. laughs> Modeled here. Um, and you know, we've put a lot of um, time and thought to make sure that it is safe, but also still welcoming. This next few months is actually adjusting and being ready to tweak, seeing what we can do differently. The Bronte Lounge digital events have been a huge success. We're going to expand that program. It's, there's obviously, and as this, as this event demonstrates, there's clearly a global appetite for a, a Bronte gathering. There's a Bronte community out there across the world and, and um, Zoom and actually COVID has made that possible because it's something we've always wanted to do but then we, we just have to do it because we have no choice. Yeah, mm -hmm. the only thing that I would um, add to that is we're looking to um, offer private tours as well. Um, so these will take place when the museum's actually closed to visitors. Um, and they'll give um, people the opportunity to go around the museum, either with myself or one of my colleagues, um, and to see the research library, where I'm sitting at the moment, um, and also to see a few of the um, treasures from the collection. Yeah, thank you so much. You've given us so many rich responses and lots of interesting gems and ideas. And I know that, that Sarah and I both as members, and I'm sure everyone else that's kind of watching this, it's just so thrilled that you're that you're reopening, and I know we're, you know I speak on behalf of Bronte fans everywhere. So we're just so excited to see how things unfold, and wish you all every success with it. Thank yeah. you, and thank, thank you. you both again for all the work you've done into this very special event, and yeah. thank you to everyone who's watching for all the support that we know you've given in the last couple of weeks, mm. months, years. <laughs> um, where does time go? But no, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure.